Well, good morning. I'm so glad that you've chosen to be a part of our worship this morning. We're going to have a wonderful day of celebrating all that the Lord has done, and we're going to commit our hearts, recommit our hearts to serving Him with gladness. We have our uh, our Family Life Center is all set up over there uh, with different tables for the various ministries of our church so that we can go after the service and go see uh, what the Lord is doing at Myrtle Grove Baptist Church. And we want you to be a part of it. And we are thankful for all that you do and how you serve and how the Lord uses you. And so as we strive together to do the Lord's will and work for Him, the Lord builds us up together as one body. And Paul is going to say in the message today, he's going to say there is one faith, one hope, and one baptism, one unity of the Spirit that we all are celebrating together and living in together, the Lord living in us and working through us. And so uh, in that same vein comes another today uh, to submit to the ordinance of believers' baptism. And we're so thankful that she's coming today. Uh, Miss Tammy, would you come? There you go. And this is Miss Tammy Traywick, and uh, she joined our church yesterday, along of oh, yesterday, last Sunday, <laughs> along with uh, the rest of her family. And if you're part of Miss Tammy's family, would you go ahead and stand up so we can recognize you? Yeah. Thank you so much for being here this morning to support Miss Tammy. All right, you can have a seat now. Thank you for all that you do in her life, and thank you for how you've been there for her in difficult times. And Miss Tammy, you told me that when you were younger, you had come and been baptized before mm -hmm. and all of those things, but you strayed away. And, but then you told me that when you had uh, your third child, that it was very, very difficult, mm -hmm. and you almost died. And, during the, and through that, the Lord brought you back to himself, and he reassured you of his love for him, for you, and you reassured him of your love for you, for him. I got that all mixed up. So you all both love each other. That's the most important thing. And, and, uh, and you rededicated your life and your heart to the Lord to serve him. And so I'm so thankful for what the Lord did through that to bring you to him. And so I'll ask you this morning, in whom are you trusting as your personal Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Are you ready to love and serve Jesus for the rest of your life? Yes. Amen. Amen. Well, Tammy, based on your profession of faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. All right. Let's pray for Miss Tammy. Father God, we are so thankful, Lord, for your love, your mercy that never fails us, Lord. And even when we stray from you, Lord, Lord, you never give up on us. And Father, we thank you that you have loved Miss Tammy in this way, and she has put her faith and her trust in you. And I pray that her testimony would reach far and wide and bear fruit for your kingdom as others see her faith, her walk with you, Lord that they would put their faith in you as well. Lord, we especially pray for her family. We pray for Mr. Stacy. We pray for the children. We pray, dear God, that they would all come to know you in due season and follow along in their mother's footsteps. And Lord, today we worship and we celebrate the new life that we have in Christ. And so, Lord, we pray that we would celebrate and worship you in spirit and in truth now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. Let's take just a minute and greet someone who's standing around you. If you are, if you see someone around you that you don't know, make sure you shake their hand and welcome them. For, uh, thank them for being here today.
you stand and sing with us? To Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the world's hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the roar. is built.
ahead and let y'all be seated for just a moment. I know about you this morning that I'm thankful for that cornerstone today and, and that cornerstone that we have in Christ. Of course, that song refers us uh, back to 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, which goes back to Isaiah, Isaiah 28. And, and Peter wrote this about the cornerstone, or he quoted this. He says, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and it says, and he who believes in him will by no means be put to shame. And again, we are just grateful for that promise of God's word. And that in these days and times when things are uncertain or we have questions about things, that, that we can, our faith can always go back to Christ. And he is that cornerstone that we rely on. Yeah, just glad that you're here today. I'm so glad that you've decided to come and join us for worship this morning. Uh, again, as we come together and just uh, and, uh, to stir the waters of bap the baptistry today, again, just makes it a great day already. And we're grateful for what God is doing and for him just allowing us to be a part of what he wants to do 
here at Marble Grove Baptist Church. Again, don't, don't forget, after the service, everyone's invited over to the Family Life Center for our, our ministry fair, our serve, our serve Sunday. Again, we'll have different uh, teams set up over there with tables and, and folks representing those teams. So if you're interested in more information or signing up to help serve or, or indicating your interest in a, in a particular ministry here around the church, then uh, this is your opportunity to do that and also get some lunch uh, while, you're, while you're there. So again, hope you'll join us after the service this morning. Again, I believe we do have a, an announcement right now. now uh, Brother David Schaffner has got a video announcement and just invite you to turn your attention to the screen now. Is our teenagers are planning another road trip. This is their second one. It's going to be at the Crazy Horse Restaurant out on Lillian Highway. Uh, it's going to be a week from Thursday, so the 11th of May, 11.15. Uh, the bus will be going out there if you need transportation. So just look in your bulletin, keep up with it, and... You're going to be blessed, I promise you, in the love of Jesus. Amen. Well, that'll be a fun time. Uh, this morning, we want to continue worshiping, so if you would stand up with us. We introduced this song last week, uh, and this is song is, it just gives us an opportunity to vocalize uh, what we believe as a church. with us it's our father everlasting the all creating one God almighty through your holy spirit conceiving Christ the son Jesus our savior Judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light. Ever seated high.
morning. My name is Chris. I'm one of your deacons here at the church. Would you join me in prayer this morning? Father God, we thank you this morning to come to your house and worship you, Lord. We're just so thankful we still live in the country where we are allowed to do that, Father. Lord, we pray for those that are here today that we thank them for coming out and just want to welcome them here, Lord, and just be our pastor this morning as he brings the message. Be with those that can't be here today, Lord, in the military, watching on foreign shores and here in our country. Be the emergency responders, Lord, just watch over and protect them. Do this tithe and offer and use it to further your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> if you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. You can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take my hands, Lord, and my feet. Search my heart, Lord, speak to me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. You can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take my hands, Lord, and my feet. Touch my heart, Lord, speak for me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. You can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take my hands, Lord, and my feet. Touch my heart, Lord, speak to me. You can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Thank you, Brother Cody and our praise team. Amen. Absolutely wonderful. And I'm so thankful that the Lord has chosen to use you. When I uh, mentioned to Brother Jim Simmons this morning on the topic of the sermon, when we're talking about the calling of God on our lives, Brother Jim said, well, if he's going to call you, that means he's got your number. And uh, the Lord Jesus has gotten every one of your numbers and he's calling you right now today. He's, he's been calling you. And the question is, have you answered that call? Here's the biblical truth. We'll get right to it this morning. God has called you, every single one of us in the room, every single person that walks on the planet, God has called you to be saved. That means to repent of your sin and put your faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. And then to be sanctified. And that means the, the process of making you more like Jesus. That's really what that's about. He's calling you to be holy. And then lastly, he's called you to be serving. And we've got opportunities for you to sign up to serve today. So if you join us later on, then you'll see all the different ways that you can serve. But no matter who you are, if you're a Christian, God has called you to be serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul, as he writes in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, Paul's in prison. We don't know exactly where he was, but he wrote this letter to the churches in, in Asia Minor, specifically, we believe, to Ephesus, uh, to encourage them to be unified by the gospel that they had believed. And, and part of that, a big part of that, was for each individual member to answer their specific calling in the church. What had God called them to do? But collectively, as a church, to be the church that God called them to be. And that's the same for you and me. Well, there's, there's two questions that we have to ask uh, whenever it, it comes to Christian maturity. Number one, what is my calling? And that's what we'll talk about today. What is my calling? And then next week, we're going to delve into the question, what is my gift? What is my gift? So to, today we're looking at what is my calling, and there's three implications of a calling. And the first is a calling implies someone who calls. If, 
if there is a calling, then someone is issuing that call. Well, who is that person that calls? Well, it's none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. He's calling every one of his followers to serve him. And then also a calling implies someone who answers or someone to answer, at least. And so that's you. And that's me. God is calling and he has your number. But thirdly, a calling implies a direction to follow. There is some area of obedience that the Lord is calling you to today. Something, some in your life that the Lord is calling you to do, to be faithful and to obey that calling. And maybe what you've done like so many people, countless people across the world, is that you've tuned the Lord out. You've changed the radio station. You've taken the phone and put it off the hook. I don't think we can even do that anymore in the modern day and age of cell phones. Does anybody even have a landline still? It's okay. All right, there's a few people. But you know what, it's, what it used to be to take the phone off the hook, right? When you call, you get a busy signal. Your calling from God over your life is, is unique. It's not like any other calling. It's not a career calling. Although it will determine that. It's not a calling to education or a particular educational track. Although it may dictate that. It's not your calling to be married or single or to start a family or to move to another place. Although it can result in all of those things. The calling of God is a spiritual calling that He places upon your life for you to be saved, sanctified, and serving. Some people think that when you become a Christian, then you sit and you soak and you sour. <laughs> or at least that's what their life looks like. But no, He's called every one of you, every one of us, to serve Him with everything that we have if we know Him. And if we don't know Him, He's called us to get to know Him. And so, let's hear what Paul says to the Ephesians in chapter 4. Why don't you stand with me? We'll begin in verse 1. Paul says, I therefore a prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Let's stop right there. We'll pick it up next time in verse 7. Father God, we are thankful for your word today. We pray, Lord, that you would bless the reading and hearing of your word with obedience to everything that we've heard and understand. And Lord, from that obedience, may you pour out your blessings and fruitfulness to follow. Lord, we pray that we would be a church that not only has answered the call, Lord, but walks in a manner worthy of that call. Lord, that lives consistently with the gospel we proclaim. And Father, that many more souls will be brought to glory through our witness. And Lord, we'd never get tired. We'd never back up. Sit down, that we never, Lord, give up, but Lord, we would rise up to do your will. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And when we think about this calling, number one, what I want to I want to describe this calling to you. Number one, it is a holy calling. It's a holy calling. And notice what he says again with me in verse one. He says that I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord. He doesn't say a prisoner of the Lord. He says a prisoner for the Lord. What does he mean by that? Well, he doesn't mean that the Lord has just bound him in chains uh, for no good reason. The Lord has called him and bound him to the work that he's been called to do. You watch Paul's life through the book of Acts and also everything he says in his epistles where he writes to Timothy and Titus and to the other churches. He tells them that he's a prisoner for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
It's, it's not just for uh, the fact that Paul was not doing things that he should have been done that he went to jail. Paul wasn't doing anything evil. Paul was doing good things. In fact, he was doing the greatest thing. He had the highest calling, and that calling was for the sake of the gospel. And he was willing even to die for that calling because he knew it was a calling from God. And it's a holy calling. And you and I are called with a holy calling. And he tells him, uh, he urges them to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. In other words, if God's called you in a particular direction to be saved, to be sanctified and to be serving, you shouldn't be going the other direction. Now, the word worthy, as Paul uses it here, it doesn't mean that, that because of something you did or something I did, that that makes me worthy to be called by God. Don't get that wrong. That's not what Paul is saying. What Paul is saying is, it's a matter of consistency. The way that you walk. When you repented from your sin and you turned to Jesus Christ, he's telling us we should never go back down that same road of sin again. We should be walking in a manner worthy of the calling. In other words, in the right direction. Jesus you know, even speaks about how the, the dog returns to its vomit and the sow returns to the mud after it's been washed. Now, I didn't call you a dog. And I didn't call you a pig. But that's what Jesus likens us to whenever we choose not to walk in a manner worthy of our calling, instead to go back into the sinful, degenerate lifestyle that we used to live in. There are many people that preach today, like I've said, that, that say that you can have your sin and Jesus too. And you know what that is? That's a problem of inconsistency. You're walking in a manner that is unworthy of your calling. To live that way. And so Jesus is calling us out of it. It's a holy calling. It's a call to salvation. It's a call to sanctification. What is the word sanctification? Well, it means to become holy as God is holy. To look more and more like Jesus. And listen, you don't make yourself holy. You simply follow Jesus. And as you're following Him, He sanctifies you. He makes you more like Him. Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.9, God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of His own purpose and grace, which He gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Now you are called to be holy. That means set free from sin. Now that's the beginning of your sanctification is the, the day that you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are regenerated. You are born again. You're a new person, a new creation. And you, now you're being set apart for His purpose. You're set free from sin. You're set up for blessings. Whenever we think about the holy life, that's the life that God blesses. God does not bless sin. If you want to be blessed by God, and we pray that God would bless every one of us, if you want to be blessed by God, then sin is inconsistent with that blessing. Not only set free from sin and set up for blessing, but set apart for God's work. And that means that we are, we are working towards serving the Lord. That as we're sanctified now, we are a prepared vessel for, the, for God to pour His Spirit into so that we can serve His purpose now. So we are called to be saved, sanctified, and serving. And listen, if you want to grow in Christian maturity, I said there's two questions to ask. What's my calling and what's my gift? And growing in Christian maturity means growing in service. And you are never more like Jesus than when you serve. When you serve the people around you, when you serve the sake, for the sake of the gospel, you are fulfilling your calling to be serving the Lord Jesus. And growing in your Christian maturity. And so it's a holy calling. It's a call not to live as the world lives. And not to live in a manner inconsistent with the gospel. But secondly, it's a humble calling. Look at verses 2 and 3. It says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now that's, 
I don't know if there's more poetic words in all of the New Testament than what Paul said about the church at least right here. But pride lifts you above others around you. It makes you feel like you're better than the people around you in some way or more deserving. Humility keeps you rooted on the level ground of the cross. When we think about humility, humility is essential to what follows after all of this. If you don't start right there with humility, then you'll never be gentle. You'll never be patient. You'll never bear with one another in love. You'll never have unity in peace without humility. What is humility? Humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is thinking of yourself less. And humility is, is not a... a, a a, a woe is me or I'm less than everybody else. It's a sober estimation of who you are before a holy God. That you don't deserve anything that Jesus did for you and you're just like everyone else. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. Can somebody say amen to that? That's me. That's you. That's what humility is really about. If you don't start there, then you've got all kinds of problems. That's why the world has all the problems that it has today. It's a lack of humility. And it's the presence of pride. And that's why we're where we are. And if, listen, I'm going to say this real quick. And I, and I don't want to step on anybody's toes, but i got to say it. If you think that as a church we've dealt with prejudice simply because we can accept one another on the basis of the content of our character rather than our skin color. And we're not there yet. Because here's what I want you to understand. Prejudice goes much deeper than skin color. <laughs> because there's all kinds of ways that we can judge other people and prejudge them. Now, shame on us if we ever judge anybody based on their skin color. That is sinful and hateful. And it should never be a part of God's church. But we can judge people on a whole lot more than that, too. We can judge people on the level of education that they have. Or the amount of money they have in their checkbook, whether they can put money in the plate or not. Whether they dress the way that we do. Whether they were in the military or not. I'm going to hide back here. Whether they're married or not. There's all kinds of ways that we can be prejudicial. In our relationships with other people. But humility says in sober estimation. I am equal. To you. Neither of us deserve the grace of God. That's why it's called grace. We all deserve the judgment of God. You know, the, <clears throat> the humility is essential, but when Jesus talks about himself, he talks about himself by the second word, the word gentleness or meekness. Matthew eleven. 29 through 30, Jesus describes his own character. The only time in all of the New Testament where Jesus describes himself and listen to how he speaks of himself. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am what? Gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus doesn't come as some sort of tyranny, a tyrant over you. Jesus says, Kate, Take my yoke, for it is easy and my burden is light. He's gentle. Jesus is an absolute gentleman. If Jesus weren't a gentleman, then all of us would be saved. There wouldn't be a single lost person in this room, nor out in the community or anywhere. He would force us all to be saved. But what does Jesus do in the book of Revelation? He stands at the door and knocks. He doesn't bust the door down. He doesn't make his way the only way for you. He says, if you want to go your own way, you can. He gives you the choice. He's a gentleman. Well, I wonder about you and me. Are we so prideful that it is my way and my way only? I have to have what I want. And for some of us, the church is the perfect uh, ecosystem for us to enter in 
and enforce our will upon that environment. But that's not what Paul teaches. Paul teaches us humility and gentleness and patience. Well, why do we need to add patience in here? We need patience because sometimes people aren't where they ought to be. And oftentimes, we think they're not where we want them to be. But hey, if we look at ourselves with humility... We're not where we ought to be either, are we? No, we're not. And the thing is, if we lose our patience, we will find ourselves lashing out at others when they're not where they should be or where we want them to be. And then if, if we lash out, what we'll end up finding ourselves is all alone. We'll just be alone. Because no one is going to measure up. And if you don't have patience with people, You'll be all alone. And then he goes on to say, bearing with one another in love. You know, the idler pulley on my truck went out one day. Did anybody know what an idler pulley is? I got a few hands. Uh, I may get corrected later on after the service about this, but to me, the idler pulley, even though it's seemingly insignificant, it's not connected to the alternator or the steering pump, or the oil pump, it's not right on top, it's not on top of the comp compressor. It's kind of by itself, and it simply puts tension on the belt. Am I right about that? Okay, see, I told you I'd get corrected. <laughs> but the point is, it's there, and it doesn't seem very important, but when it goes out, the serpentine belt will slip, and nothing wants to work anymore. All right, he's shaking his head, so I got it right. This is our resident mechanic, Mr. Jason. And we're like those idler pulleys, every one of us. Sometimes we just have to bear the burden without any of the recognition. And we bear with one another because if we don't, everything gets out of whack. The relationships begin to break down. We begin to have evil suspicions against one another. And we enforce our way. And then the other person doesn't get what they want. And they're impatient. And so everybody just hates each other. And Paul says in the church, if we know the Lord Jesus Christ, we have a calling to humility. It means that if you have humility, then you will be able to bear with those failings of other people. Because why? You realize, I need somebody to bear with me. Jesus bears with me. He puts up with me, even though I don't deserve it. Now, what did they say to you and what did they do to you this week? Are you bearing with it? Are you patient with them the way the Lord is patient with you? Are you gentle with them the way the Lord is gentle with you? Are you humble with them? When you're clothed with humility, you take upon yourself the character of Christ. And so it's a humble calling. And so it's a... A holy calling, it's a humble calling. And thirdly, it's a hopeful calling. Look at what it says in verse 4. There is one body and one spirit. Which is a reminder that, hey, we're all part of that same body. And if we start to fuss and fight, you're going to tear the body apart. And then he says there's, not only is there one body and one spirit. He says, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. There is one hope that belongs to your call. The one hope that belongs to your call means that it is a hope-filled calling. Well, what is that hope? Listen to what God says to His people in Jeremiah 29, 11. After they've, they, they're, 
hearing this news that they're going into exile, God reminds them that they are his people and that he's not going to to uh, forsake them forever. In verse 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. You see, sometimes whenever the Lord Jesus has called us away from a lifestyle of sin and a lifestyle of living in the mud and the dirt to salvation and then to sanctification and then to service and eventually we're going to be glorified. Sometimes along that road, we start to think that it was for no good reason that God has called us to wherever we're serving. We get tired. Some of you are tired right now and you're tempted to take a nap. Wake up. You need this more than anybody else does. We're tired. We're frustrated because, hey, we didn't get our way. The pride has taken the place of humility. So we're in the middle of the the battle, the fight, the tension. Or maybe we're in a season of our life where we really just don't see God working at all. And we think, well, maybe he's just given up and maybe I didn't hear the calling that he gave me. And I'm, I'm off doing the wrong thing here. Because we're not seeing fruitfulness in our life. And what the Lord wants to tell you right now is there is hope in your calling. God doesn't call you for no reason. That was a double negative. God doesn't call you for no reason. In other words, God calls you for a reason. When there is no faith in a future, there is no power in the present. And some of you are tempted to give up right now, but you need to hear what the Lord has to say to you. He knows the plans He has for you. He has called you to give you a future and a hope. You've seen any of these, these videos where somebody will call their dog when their dog is sitting right there? Have you ever seen that? It, it, to me, it's like emotional turmoil for the dog. Like they don't know what to think because they're sitting right there, but they're being called and just, they can't understand. Watch this dog for a second. Watch its reaction. Bailey. Bailey. Come here, Bailey. Come on, girl. Come on. Bailey. The dog's like, what's up? Why are you calling me? I mean, when you call a dog, the dog expects that it's going to have what, what you've conditioned the dog to do, which he's going to get petted, or she's going to get a treat, or we're going to go out for a walk or something. There's going to be some sort of reward for my responding to you because you called me, right? And when the Lord calls us, sometimes we think that There will be no reward at the end of this. We we just forget about that. And we get discouraged. But what he wants to remind you is if he has called you, there will be a reward. There's hope in that calling. And it's all the one hope that we all have. And what is that? That one day we will shed this mortal body And we will see Him face to face and in a moment in the twinkling of an eye we will be changed and we will be glorified and we will be made like Him and we will live with Him forever in a place with no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more pain. We're going there one day, folks. And there will be a reward for everything that you do. He says there will not be a single cup of cold water that's given in His name to somebody, one of the least of these, that He will not remember and repay. Wow, you think about that. And the Ephesian church suffered just like any of the other churches in Asia Minor. They had hardships and pain. Even the, the one who planted the church, Paul himself, is imprisoned right now for the gospel as he writes. And it would be easy for that Ephesian church to just give up. I'm done. I'm done with this calling stuff. I know God calls, He saves, and He sanctifies, and He calls us to be serving, but I'm just done with it. I'm tired of it. It's too hurtful. It's too painful. If we give up, then we'll lose that reward that would have been ours. I'm going to tell you the story, just a little bit of the story of Adoniram Judson for a moment. 
He was the son of a congregational minister, and he was raised in a Christian home. And historians tell us that by the age of three, he was already reading and quoting Scripture. Three years old. Think about that. Wow. As a teenager in college, though, Adoniram went astray. He engaged in all sorts of immorality, was influenced by a fellow student friend named Jacob Eames. He was a deist and a skeptic. And some sources even say he was an atheist. But either way, Judson was lured away from the faith that had been passed down by his father. However, unknown to Judson, God in His divine providence had great plans in store for him. One evening while he was traveling as an adult, Adoniram stayed in an inn And the only room that was available in the inn was next to a dying sick man with less than soundproof partitions in between those two rooms. He told the innkeeper that that room would be okay because he was an unbeliever and he didn't have any fear of death. And all throughout that night he heard the wailing, the moaning, The helpless cries of desperation of a dying man. Well, that made such an impact on him. He wanted to go over and do something to bring comfort. But having renounced his faith, he had no words of comfort to offer to this dying man. Judson just pulled the covers over his head and finally went to sleep. Well, the next day... He inquired about the sick man and the innkeeper told him, well, he died last night. To his surprise and dismay, the miserable dying man's name was Jacob Eames, his best friend from college. And he was dead. And he was lost. And he was lost, lost, lost. For days, it raced through Judson's mind. The Holy Spirit of God began to convict him and to draw him back to himself and to reassure him of his calling. Is it a coincidence that Jacob Eames was next door, the dying man in the room? A coincidence is simply God remaining anonymous. So Judson went and enrolled in seminary and later gave his life to foreign missions. He translated the Bible into Burmese, the language of the people where he served. And on their journey to that place, their ship was tossed about in a three-week monsoon. His pregnant wife, Anne, became very sick and had a baby that immediately died and was buried at sea. It was six years after landing in Burma that they saw the first Burmese convert to Christianity. Six years. Judson was also once driven in chains across burning sands until his back bled and his feet were blistered. Adonai spent many years in jail, in chains, in stocks, in filthy infested prison cells. He was sustained only by the Lord and his wife who would come to him, who herself was very ill. She had another baby while he was in prison, and she wasn't able to produce milk for the baby, so she had to go around and ask nursing mothers to nurse her baby, to keep her her baby alive. Burma was a constant battle for the Judsons. 108 degree heat, Cholera, malaria, dysentery, filth. They had arrived in Burma 17 months after they had gotten married. And when Adoniram was 24 and Anne was 23 years old. But in less than 14 years after their arrival, Judson had buried his dear wife, Anne. All of their children died. Eventually, two of Judson's wives that he had remarried died there. 
And then seven of the remaining 13 children died well as well. And then also he lost several of his colleagues who were there serving. And someone would say, did Judson miss his calling? Had God called him and then left him to die on the vine? Did he call him for no reason? Was God unaware? Listen to this though. At Judson's death when he was 61, Burma had 63 Christian churches. In 61 years, this man planted 63 Christian churches. And they had 7,000 converts to faith in Jesus Christ. And today, Burma has over 3,700 congregations and over 600,000 members of churches today. Southern Baptist churches, by the way. That's a different story, but Adam Iron started out as a Congregationalist and studied baptism and became a Baptist. Amen? And so it's a hopeful calling. What does that mean? Our calling is filled with hope. That we are called not just to look ahead, but to look up as we're on that road following the Lord Jesus. Not only is it that hopeful calling, lastly, it is a high calling. It is a high calling. And there is no higher calling than to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Look, look with me again, verses 5 through 6. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. One Lord means that there is no higher authority. Everything else that calls you, what the world would want you to do, the world and all of its trappings is pulling on either edge of you. Well, it's a lesser Lord than it, the Lord Jesus. One Lord, one faith, meaning that only faith in Jesus saves us from eternal condemnation. There's nothing else that's going to save us. There's one baptism. Well, this baptism represents the regeneration of the believer. It's an outward sign of an inward change. We were once dead in our trespasses and sin, but now we've been made alive through the Spirit. We've been born again, and there's only one way that that happens. Through faith in Jesus. One God and Father. There are not many ways to get to what you call God. Like Oprah says. On the Oprah Winfrey t- television show. There's only one way. Jesus said that He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Him. There's only one true God. And He's got your number. And He's calling you today. And then He says He's over all. And through all. And in all. Well, what does that mean? Well, he's speaking specifically when he says all. He's talking about all believers. Because the Ephesian church suffered the same maladies that we all suffer today as church members. Prejudice. Pride. All of those things that would divide a church. Skin color. Economic status. Educational status. Political affiliation. All of these things that would divide the church. And Paul wants that church to know that there is only one God that's over the church. There's only one Lord over the church. And not only is He over the church, He's over everything. He's above everything. And when you're called to be saved, sanctified and serving, you're called to serve the highest Lord that there is. The highest being that there is. He's above all. He's through all, meaning that everything that you do in the, sanctific- in the saving process, the sanctification process, and the serving process, all that you do, it's Him at work through you. It's not of you, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's only because of His grace at work through you. And if you ever have anything to offer anyone else, it's simply Jesus living in you. That's why it's so important. To be living for Him and loving Him every single day of your life. So that He can use you. And if He can use anything, He can use you, right? 
and in all. Who's inside of me? Folks, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He's the one living in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. It's not me, it's Him. He empowers me. And you know what that means? I'm not afraid of anything. I am invincible until He's through with me. Ephesians 2, 5 through 7 says, Even when we were dead in our trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. He has raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Where are we? We are seated with Christ in heaven. That's where you are. We say, no, pastor, I'm seated on this pew right now. In the worship center. What does Paul say? No. You're seated in heaven with Christ. That's where your seat is. And that seat is permanent. And nothing can change that. If you've been saved. And called to be sanctified and serving. What greater purpose could there be. Than for the master to choose you. To use you. What else is more important folks. Just answer that question rhetorically (laughs) in your mind. What else is more important for your time, your energy, your effort? Does anything rise to the level of serving Jesus? Nothing. So Paul says to the Philippian church, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call. Of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says it's uphill all the way to heaven. Amen. Lay aside a life of meaningless and take up the life of purpose. Of the promised king. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you know the story. He was a young man. Became a pastor. Left the United States to go back to his home country of Germany. To fight against the Nazis and... Eventually, he gave his life. But he wrote a book. um, And he talks about what it means to be a disciple of Christ. And in that book, he said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. When Christ calls a man, calls a woman, when he calls you, he bids you to come and die. What does that mean? That means, literally, it could mean come and die. But probably what it means more than that for you and me is to come and live for Jesus. To die to the life that you would live otherwise. And live a life of sanctification and holiness and service. I wonder for you today, what does that mean? What do you need to die to today? I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. As Jesus dialed your number today. Is the phone ringing or is the phone off the hook? Is he getting a busy signal? If he's called you today and you don't know Jesus, he's called you to be saved today. That's what the call that he's issuing issuing to you is. It's a call to lay down your, your life for Jesus and say, I do believe that you lived a sinless life for me, a sinner, and you died for me. And to put your faith in Him. If you want to do that now, I want to lead you in a prayer. You just pray this prayer after me. And this is your confession of faith in Jesus. Pray it in your heart. Say, Jesus, I admit to you that I am a sinner. That I have failed to do the things that I know are right. And I've done the things that I know are wrong. But Jesus, I believe that you lived a sinless life and that you died for me on a cross. I believe that you were raised again on the third day. And so I come to you now and I ask you to forgive me. Make me a new person. Save me, Jesus, I pray. 
And I'll spend the rest of my life loving you and serving you. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? If you prayed that prayer and something wonderful and amazing, supernatural has happened in your life, you've just given your heart over to the Lord, the King of Kings, and He has saved you. And He's written your name down in the Lamb's Book of Life and He has a plan for your life as you serve Him that you can never imagine how wonderful it will be. And one day you'll be in heaven with Him. If you've made that decision today and you've prayed that prayer, we want to welcome you into the family of faith. We want to rejoice with you and with the angels of heaven over your salvation. And so this is your invitation to come and to share what Jesus has done in your heart. If you are a Christian, but you've gone astray and you're coming back now and you're saying, Lord, I want to walk in a manner worthy of the calling that you put on my life. I want to be walking daily with you, being sanctified and made holy. And I want to serve you. And this is your invitation. And if you've been walking with the Lord, and you're looking for avenues of service and you want to know how the Lord wants you to serve, I'll pray with you. Our altar counselors will be here to pray for you. Whatever the case may be, whatever it is, you do business with the Lord during our invitation. Let's sing together. All to Jesus I surrender all to Him I freely give. do you mean what you just sang? Do you surrender it all? I want us to sing, if you can use me one more time, Cody, just that one more time through that. But if you meant that, then let's sing that song one more time. That Here are my hands and here are my feet, Lord. Lord, speak through me. I want you to, I want you to sing that because that's going to be kind of our, our prayer as we go out. We'll ask Drew to close us in prayer after this, but but this is going to be our prayer as we go out and we go over to the Family Life Center and we look at all the different avenues of service. And if you look around and you say, well, there's not really a table for me, then write your name on a little card and sit down at the table and tell everybody about the way that you believe that you're being led to serve. Okay? That's what I'll invite you to do. That. I'm sure there's space at one of those tables. But pray this prayer, okay, and mean it with all your heart. Lord, take our hands, take our feet. You go to those tables and you find the avenue that the Lord would have you to serve. Let's sing it, Cody, one more time.
You can use anything, Lord, you can use me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take my hands, Lord, and my feet. Touch my heart, Lord, speak for me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. All right, church family, two super, super quick youth announcements. If your teenager is signed up to go with us to Centrifuge uh, in South Carolina, we will be having a parents meeting on May 17th. So not this Wednesday, but the next. We'll have a parents meeting to get you all the info uh, when we're leaving, which is going to be really early in the morning because we're going to South Carolina. Super pumped about that. Y'all pray for me. Um, but then on top of that, if you, again, if you have not picked one of the cards that is back here with our Pick a Card fundraiser, uh, you can do that. This Sunday is the last Sunday to pick one up. And then if you took one already, please, please, please be sure you return that card uh, filled up with whatever your heart desires on it uh, next Sunday. Okay? Uh, so please bring those back next Sunday. All right, that being said, I'll bless our food and we'll get over to the Family Life Center. God, we love you, and we praise you. We thank you so much for the opportunity, God, to come here freely and to worship you and to fellowship with, with other believers, to, to have a day like today, to see the many different ministries and ways that our church impacts the, the community around it. God, we thank you for those ministries. We thank you for those ministry leaders. And God, I pray right now that if there's anybody that's just on the fence about how they're, they're going to serve in this church or how, or how they need to or, or how they need to go about it, God, I pray that you give them clarity on it. I pray that you help them to take a leap of faith, to step out in confidence in you and to serve you fully. God, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for the service. We thank you for the word. In your heavenly name, amen.